Enormous pyroclastic clouds of pulverized concrete? Well, where is all the concrete, in fact? Let's listen to Jeff King. One of the most significant things to, to my thinking uh, uh, that indicates that this could not have been the sort of collapse that we are told it was is the presence of the dust clouds. Uh, and as you've seen in the pictures, and I'm sure all of us have, have uh, seen probably more than we would like, uh, there were very, very large clouds of very thick dust that enveloped the area that crossed the river that made it almost all the way to New Jersey from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, this type of flow is something that we are familiar with in physics. It occurs in only two situations that we know of naturally. Uh, one is in volcanic eruptions where a large amount of material is suddenly exploded into the air and basically forms small particles. Thank you, Jeff. How about New York Governor Pataki? And you look, and you see, and there's no concrete. There's very little concrete. All you see is aluminum and steel. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized. And I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. And how about this firefighter? You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. And this dust made it almost across to New Jersey, across the river. Uh, thick, billowing, laying a carpet of four to six inches thick around lower Manhattan, uh, pulverized to uh, 100 micron to, to 10 mil particles, almost like talcum powder, some of it. It's uh, very, very fine. Where's the grinder that produced this? 90,000 tons of it. In these clouds that expanded 10 times the volume of the buildings themselves in just 30 seconds. Now, the available gravitational potential in the whole building is about 110,000 kilowatt hours. That's basically the weight of the building times its height above the ground, uh, evened out. But the expansion of these clouds has been calculated to require about 10 times that energy in heat, which produces that expansion. So uh, we have a problem here. In fact, the gravitational potential of the entire building needs to also produce four other heat sinks. But first, we have a 15-story building. This part of the gravitational potential alone, it co it's converted all of its gravitational potential into kinetic energy. It can't do any more work. In other words, it can't fall at free fall speed and then also crush 80,000 tons of structural steel. It can't fall at free fall speed and also grind up 90,000 tons of concrete. It can't fall at free fall speed and create by friction or anything else the several tons of molten metal seen by the first responders. The energy doesn't add up. We're talking ab uh, overall about 50 times the gravitational potential energy of the building to produce all of this phenomena. How about the victims? In April 2006, New Yorkers were distressed to learn that bone fragments, human remains from 9-11, had been found on the roof of the nearby Deutsche Bank building. And how in, in God's name did those fragments get there? And bone fragments less than a centimeter long. How could they be so small? 700 bone fragments, a half an inch long, found on top of the skyscraper across the street. Think about that one. There were 2,749 victims, but only 300 whole bodies were found. 20,000 pieces of bodies found. 6,000 small enough to fit into a test tube. 1,100 victims completely unaccounted for. In other words, no pieces large enough to gain any DNA from, vaporized. 200 pieces were matched to one single person. Can fire and a gravitational collapse account for this massive pulverization of people. We talked about the iron microspheres. 
We talked about the chemical evidence of thermite in them and in the slag and the ends of the beams. And we talked about evidence of thermite in and unexploded thermite in the dust itself. All of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. And none of it can be accounted for by fire. Let's have Dr. David Ray Griffin sum this one up for us. These facts taken together render the likelihood of the official theory essentially zero. In fact, each of the ten phenomena, the likelihood of it occurring without explosives being used is by itself essentially zero. But let's be generous and suggest maybe there's a 1% chance that these things could occur. Virtual free fall speed, straight down, enormous amount of dust. 1% chance. But when you figure up the probabilities then, when you say how many, uh, that two of them would occur, three of them would occur, by the time you get up to 10 of them occurring without explosive, you're talking about the likelihood of one in a trillion. So we can say that the official theory about the towers is disproved as thoroughly as any such theory could possibly be. Whereas all the evidence can be explained by the alternative theory according to which the towers were brought down by explosives, the official theory is therefore an outrageous theory, whereas the alternative theory is, from a scientific point of view, the only possible theory. Thank you.